by as I have 25 minutes, I will not waste your time too much. I hope you're ready for three times mic in a row. It's it's something that you have to take, no no other chance. And um, my mic talk today is about performance, mm, Angular performance. But I want to try to focus on things that are not that trivial. You cannot directly read it online somewhere. It's like I hope cool tricks, cool tricks for all of you. Um, why do we need to care about performance? It's one of my really, really hype topics. I love it. Um, and in the past, I tried to convince management to tell them, look, uh, revenue here, the statistics there, we have the numbers, we have numbers, numbers, numbers. It didn't really work. And um, in fact, it's really easy to explain why performance matters. You know the term rage click? It's not a good and not a positive information, uh, information em emotion. Do you want your users to get angry on your product, yes or no? Do you want to, your users to use your product or go to the other company that has a more appealing application? I guess you want them to stay at your app uh, and stay your users. So therefore, we do need to care about performance, about web performance, especially in 2024, when we have a couple of cool new things in, in metrics. And therefore, the whole talk uh, is arranged around the core web vitals and the non-trivial parts of core web vitals. So I will give you the introduction, what it is, how you can think of it, but then I will uh, very, very uh, quickly focus on stuff that is not that easy and you most probably uh, need to know that. Independent of the framework, uh, and, and some of those things are obviously Angular related. Let me introduce myself. My name is Michael Latke. Latke is very hard to read, right? and pronounce, and I, this is what I say all the time at every conference, let's stick with Michael. It's a little bit easier and also it's, it's better for me. Uh, I have a Twitter profile, uh, not sure if I'm active there, I try. Uh, I do some open source uh, and I run a company that's called Pushbased and we focus on helping other companies to scale in certain areas. But who needs an introduction of myself, let's introduce Core Web Vitals. We have three of them. We have cumulative layout shift, interaction to next paint, and largest contentful paint. And those three different metrics are three different uh, uh, ways on how the user experience your website. And the first one is very hard to read when you read it the first time. Cumulative layout shifts, what is it? What can we... Mm, expect and is it okay and cumulative shift is the visual stability of your website so if you try to consume this application it should not jump around right you don't want to refocus again and again on the line that you actually read the second uh, metrics is INP interaction to next paint I love it um, in the past we had non so not so nice uh, metrics like total blocking time or first input delay. Uh, INP, I will go into that with here, is the responsiveness of your website through the whole visit. So not only when you load the page and you look at it for the first time, but the whole lifetime of the user session. And the last one is largest contentful paint. This is the loading performance of your website. How long does it take until you finally can consume the piece of content that you want to consume? Oops, that was one too fast. Uh, we have numbers. Cumulative layout shift is one of the numbers that is not in milliseconds. So we have a floating point number and good is below 0 0.1. Bad is uh, above 0 0.25. I thought it only goes to one, the scale, but then a couple of months ago I saw a CLS of seven point something and I was like, oh, okay, it's like, it, it's bigger than one. So <laughs> you can shift a lot on your website, didn't know that this is even possible. Um, what exactly is shifting? So there is a area in your website that you want to look at. It's a two-dimensional thing and the two-dimensional area shifts also for uh, some distance 
and then you multiply those two fractions and you have this floating point number. And here is a little bit of a how it works. So you have your website and then you have this very important text that you want to read. And uh, if you are not so lucky, whoop, something jumps into your website, shifts the text, you lose everything, you're like, what did I do? And especially me, a very short attention span. If you shift my text, I have no clue where I am. Like Austria, Vienna, well, crazy. So you need, if you have this shifting stuff, reserve some space because at that space that I reserve now, something is there, something very, very important. And what is more important for the user than useless ads? Hmm? Useless ads. This is what shifts your content, sometimes in many cases. Um, and therefore, we need to reserve the space for the user. Uh, some people do that with a loading spinner. Some people put some images there. And this is, I guess, what all of us can deal with, right? We, we can make some pixel space there. We can put some margin. We are capable of doing this. What's not so trivial, though, is how to deal with fonts. Right? You load the font, the font is visible immediately, you start to read it and then the font, the, the, the new font style kicks in and it, it does something and you cannot read anymore. And there is a technique that's called font style matching. How many of you ever heard about font style matching? Hands up. One, two, wonderful. So new information for you. Uh, this image here illustrates that already. I quickly jump to that to that link here, I have two fonts that are overlaid on top of each other, and then I have all the native CSS rules, and what I try with font style matching is that I ah, somehow change these values here until the two different styles overlap nearly equally, and then I know when I load uh, the original font, maybe I even managed to do that here, ah, it's, it's close, maybe like this. I don't know. So, but if I use the real font, it will not jump. I will not have a cumulative layout shift if I apply font style matching. And um, yeah, one thing that I believe people should know, there, is also, there are also scripts outside that help you to do that automatically, so that you don't fiddle around forever with the numbers. And um, good, good thing to know. The next thing. Largest contentful paint. You may say, uh, boring, I know, largest contentful paint already. I am sure I can show you some new information. Um, numbers first. A good LCP is below 2.5 seconds, not milliseconds, but seconds. And the bad one is above 4 seconds. It's just like... People get bored when they have to wait for too long and you, you really want to have a a loading time that is under the 2.5 seconds. And um, what is it? You have a LCP element. In this case, I have the Movies app with the latest movie here. And you see in red dashed lines that this, this is the largest contentful paint element here. Um, your boss looks at the largest contentful paint like this. I have to wait and see white, and then I see something, and then I finally see the image. Very easy to understand. Uh, and our developers, most of them, look at it like this. I have one single number, and this is how long it takes until my image is visible. And if you try to optimize LCP, you maybe want to have a little bit more options, right? Having options in life is cool. I also want to have more options with my LCP. So let me introduce to you LCP Breakdown. What is it? It is a theoretical tool that helps you to understand where can you improve your LCP and where not. Let's go a little bit more technical here. What do we see? The different phases of the LCP, like technical phases. I have time to first byte. I have the processing time, rendering, and paint. And then I finally see the colored pixels on my screen of the last LCP candidate. And here is plural candidates, because you can have over the loading time of your app, multiple different candidates of LCP. First, the browser thinks it is the text, then your bigger image pops in, and then, ah, oh, image is way bigger than the text, so your image is now the LCP candidate, and the last one will render. 
Understanding this helps already a little bit, but let me help you to make it even more easy. Let's think about four different phases. Time to first byte, resource load delay, resource load time, and render delay of the element. What is it? The first one is normally uh, your server or the edge or whatever that takes forever to ship the index HTML to your end. Uh, and then you run into phase two, resource load delay, fully underestimated, like everyone focuses on phase three, the resource load time, the actual time, how long it takes that your image loads. But I can tell you, phase two is very, very interesting, especially when you have single page applications and your components trigger HTTP requests. Maybe not the best thing. And you can optimize there a lot. Then we have phase three, uh, the time it takes uh, to load your image. You can do a couple of different optimizations. Um, and then we have a last phase that also not that uh, intuitive to understand. Even if you have your image in your computer's cache already, it still can take some time until it pops up as colored pixels on the screen. And that is called the element render delay. Second, uh, the bottleneck is the framework. Third, the resource is the bottleneck. And fourth, the, the, the content of your application in the browser is the bottleneck. Okay, so what can you do? You can read a little bit about resource hints. And with resource hints, you can focus on this middle part here. And I have three different green bars. Every green bar is an image. And the last one is the image, the most important image for me, the LCP image. So what can I do to get the priority and the time it takes to load that image up? Let's open up this Movies app. Let's look in the left corner. We load 20 images out of 50-something other requests. And that's a lot. And all of them um, need to load whenever you start a website. That's a little bit uh, poor poor thinking. Uh, I don't want to, uh, to increase the, the phone bill, the internet bill of my users, so I try to not load them. Uh, and what can I do? I can lazy load them. It's pretty, uh, pretty commonly known already. What you maybe not know is you can also lazy load iframes. People do that. They use iframes nowadays. Still, sometimes they are useful. And then you only load the stuff that is within your viewport, like visible in the pixels on your screen. So you get rid of other resources here with this X that are not visible at the moment in your screen. Um, you apply lazy loading, you see that the priority of all of those lazy loaded images dropped. Um, some of them are not loaded. With some of them, I mean like a decent part of it. Now we only load five images instead of 20. So already a little bit better than before. And still we can improve something. So what you, what you can do is you can think a little bit about priority hints. Uh, so you not only put the loading flag on your image, you also put the priority hint. And how do you deal with your priority hints? Um, first of all, you don't lazy load all the images, right? You only lazy load the images that is not the LCP. It's one thing that you can do good. And the second thing that you can do good is the LCP has highest priority as possible. So you put a priority hint for your LCP to high and then it will change the prioritization. It will pop up at the beginning of your HTTP queue. And then you have something like this. You see that the image normally had low priority, but through, through your resource hint changes, you changed it to high. And then it loads before anything else. Right? The browser knows this, this resource here is very, very important for my user. OK, that was the resource load delay. There is also a little bit older technology than the priority hints. We have preload and prefetch that you can also use to uh, have your images quicker available in case you need it. But uh, nothing that I want to go too much into detail today. Mm. Another thing, pretty cool, you can use source sets. 
right? If I'm on my phone, my phone is way smaller than my laptop, maybe I don't need to load the biggest image for my phone, maybe I load a very small image, just small enough to be sharp on my phone. And also stuff that people know, what people maybe don't know is it's complicated. Um, I tried that the first time, first of all, it's, uh, it's a little bit more to read than I thought, so I was like, okay, let's do the reading, why not, I, I, I can read. Um, and then I implemented my, my theoretical knowledge and the blue bar is after my optimization. And if you look at that, the blue bars are bigger than before. So I decreased the performance of uh, my application with, with source hints. And I was like really scratching my head. Right? <laughs> after, uh, after I finally hacked around, figured it out, uh, I got to this here, the correct one. As you can see, now the blue bar is way smaller than the red one, and this is what you really want to achieve. You want to load less kilobytes, you ship less bytes to, to your users. Um, <coughs> Why is this so complicated? Because the official spec and how the browser interprets that is... is uh, I would say there is a bug, right? I'm still not sure, but I say there is a bug in the official documentation. So I sat down and I was like, how can I figure out, like, do I really hack around for days to figure out which breakpoint I need to set? So I, I was like, why hacking around a full day if I can take three days to write the script? So there is this link here where I call it a source set debugging and I open up our movies app here, you see there is a, the movies app that I will refresh now. Um, I click here on inspect. I shrink down whoop, the size until it gets really, really small, like this. I cannot see it anymore. And then let me say the device pixel ratio is done and perfect. Okay, and then I click the play button on my script. The script is linked in the slides, you can picture that. And what you did not see is this image here has now a red border, a small red border. And look at the red border and look at this table here on the left when I, when I resize. I log all the different sizes of my image and whenever the browser fetches the new version, I track what was the size of my screen, what was the size of my image, and what was the diff. Yeah? Do I overscale the image at the moment or do I underscale it? And I show you what happens when I slowly increase. Here the first line jumped already in. I, I loaded an image that is not uh, 20 pixels but 150. I go bigger, I go bigger. The border, the red border gets smaller and smaller. I load a new image. I get bigger, I get bigger. Now it gets transparent. That means my image is too small for the original size. Yeah? The, the pixel ratio smaller than I display. And then I go bigger, bigger. The transparency changes again. And whoop, I'm on my full scale. So I have here now a table that shows me how big my image was displayed and how big my image was um, loaded to a certain uh, few size. And when I'm done with this one time scaling up, I know all the different numbers that I need to put. I'm done. I copy pasted in my code and it works. Um, sounds really funny, but try it without the script. You will maybe cry a little bit. Uh, that's an, that's an uh, uh, um, example of one of our uh, uh, um, audits that we've run for, Exerber, uh, for Observable HQ with the tricks I mentioned. And here you see that by CSS and image prioritization only, I went from 7 seconds to 2.5 seconds largest contentful paint. That's, I guess, a, a pretty good number. Uh, let me pet my shoulder. No, it was not only my idea. So. Okay, what is not so easy is SVG images. How many of you ever tried to lazy load an SVG images, image with the browser? I hope no one... Ah, okay, so it's not working, right? Because it's not implemented. There's no spec for it. So SVGs is a really bad bottleneck. And um, there is a library called NGX Fast SVG that we created a couple of years ago. And this uh, library basically 
helps you to do all the different tricks with SVGs just without using your brain. You just install it and it works. What does it do? We have native lazy loading. We don't use any like viewport observer logic or, or something. We use another really funny trick. It's documented online. But this zero JavaScript trick that we use enables us to have native lazy loading of SVGs. And here you see on the left and on the right, if I open up the menu, uh, the same amount of pixels is shown, and if I use our library, we see that at the beginning there are less pixels shown, and if I open up the side menu, more pixels are loaded. Pretty cool. What else uh, should you be able to do with the SVG? Lip, you can server-side render your SVGs and share them and then transport them to your client. And this is done in a very, very excellent way. We use the DOM as cache. We don't use any transfer cache from Angular. We use the DOM directly, and that has two very beautiful impacts. First of all, we can server set render and transport that to the client. Um, and after that, not a single HTTP request for SVGs is needed, right? If you server set render that, that's the only library that is capable of not shipping unnecessary bytes to your client. Uh, it's also the only library that reuses your SVGs across the website. So if you have 10 times the same SVG, you have one time the resource. Check other libraries out. It's not the case. It's terrible. Um, if you want to have full details on that, there is a talk. Uh, SVGs as lightning speed from my colleague. Uh, check it out. The link is here. And you get the full um, explanation. FID is dead. So I guess we don't need to talk about that. We should straight away talk about INP. So INP is the last number in my slide deck. Mm. And I have chilled three minutes, 40 seconds left to speed through that thing. Uh, but I'm used to that, so let's, let's keep chilled. We have 200 milliseconds INP, which is good. Everything over 500 is very bad in the Middle East to improve. What is INP, interaction to next paint? When I click my mobile phone, my browser, my device, that's the moment where INP starts, where the interaction is tracked. And that interaction could not even get processed by your browser at the moment because it is still blocked with rendering something else that is super slow. So this is the input, uh, the input delay that you see here. And then when your browser finally has time to trigger the click event, then you have the processing time and then you have rendering and paint. And in the end, when your frame finally gets presented to the user, when the pixel color finally changes, then the end of your input to next paint is here. And um, that's the newest metrics. We love it. It is a little bit hard to optimize, but it is very honest. It's very honest, and if you have a bad INP, your users really don't like it. There is uh, a talk also on that, Cut My Task Into Pieces, funny name, from Julian Yandl. And this is a real deep dive on uh, what JavaScript optimizations you can use to improve INP. And as this resource is also already out there, I want to switch to another uh, thing that you can do with INP. You can improve INP with CSS only. And this is a beautiful thing. I will rush through that in the, in the next two minutes. I will talk about two CSS rules, contain and content visibility. How many of you ever heard about one of them? Contain? Ah, five, six. I love it. New content for you. So. Uh, I will start with the, with the cool one, the one that is supported for all the old browsers too, that is Contain. If you are interested technically, here is an overview table that you can picture or, or, or open up later when I share my slides. But what can Contain does is it has an impact on your layouting time and on your time it takes to paint. So those two metrics, as you can st uh, strongly reduce with that. And the second API that I want to show here is the Content Visibility API. This is not so well supported, only in Edge and Chromium, but this is brutal. Like This is basically virtual scrolling natively implemented in your browser. And um, I show here another, um, I should go into presenter mode, another overview of the two, of the two APIs. Uh, if you're interested on how to compare them and use them, and what it does. 
So what it does is exactly the same as contain and content, uh, plus on top for all the DOM nodes that are not in your viewport, it will remove the DOM nodes, and it is for your browser as if they would not be here. Yeah? It just cuts them out of the whole render pipeline. A uh, real-life example, Brawl Irish contacted me, hey, there is this Nuxt uh, com page, if I toggle the, uh, um, the dark mode button, it fully freezes, you have any ideas? I'm like, for sure, give me a second. And then this was the output here, I made a quick measurement before and after, I added my two lines of CSS, and as you can see the different the difference is brutal, right? With four lines of CSS, I was able to improve that. I also improved scripting a little bit there, and here is another screenshot uh, on what it really meant for the INP, so I went down uh, without throttling, right? This is unthrottled laptop, it's not a, pho a phone that I measured, 250 milliseconds on my laptop, it took like two seconds on the phone, <laughs> I went down here to 60 milliseconds, that's quite a ni nice improvement for five lines of CSS. Uh, if you're interested, here's a full talk on that, a little bit old, 22, but uh, knowledge is up to date as possible. So that was uh, three metrics, um, the three core web vital metrics, cumulative layout shift, INP, and LCP that I quickly pitched to you and where I showed you what you can do to improve that numbers. I saved my, re uh, my recap thing because the time is already showing me negative numbers. I say thanks for your time. If you're interested, we also do performance audits and consulting. My name is Michael. Forget my last name. Have a nice day or evening. Bye-bye. Thank you.